Finally, I want to talk a little bit about how language um, establishes and sets up power dynamics and identity and sometimes subverts them or dissolves them. So we can think of language as not just a way of conveying information, but also as a form of social action. Uh, so sometimes we talk about how language is performative when somebody says, and now I pronounce you, you know, husband and wife or um, wife and husband or um, spouses or however we choose to refer, um, that action by the minister or by the clergy or by the justice of the peace or whoever is doing the marriage ceremony, they're not just conveying information. They're also doing something with those words. Those words are making the marriage finalized. Uh, when you christen a boat, right, give it a name, it's you're not just saying what the name of the boat is, you're giving that boat the name. So language is, we do things with language. And one of the things that we do with language is that we signal to other people what our identities are. And we also signal to other people and to ourselves what the hierarchies are between those um, identities or the equalities, right? So it's it's not sort of shocking that in a lot of religious communities the world over, um, people use terms like brother and sister to refer to each other uh, because, or some other kind of shared terminology to express sort of a common identity without hierarchies to, you know, kind of emphasize our shared religiosity. Um, and that's true also in political domains as well. It's also the case, though, that power, the language is used to make things unequal <laughs> or to establish sort of who's on top of who in the hierarchy. And it's also sometimes just used to kind of set up who's in what community. So your book talks about that idea of sort of a language community. And sometimes language communities set up specific um, ways of speaking that sort of mark who's in the group and who's not. So we call that a restricted code. Um, so a restricted code is something that is, you know, you have, for example, let me just use an example. Uh, gaming speak is an example of a restricted code because if you've never played a you know, a, uh, internet video game before, you may speak in the same language as everybody else. You're all speaking in English, for example, uh, but people start talking about lags, noobs, XP, and all this different stuff, and you might not really know what's going on. Maybe you do, but very likely not. So that's a restricted code. When a subculture um, develops a way of speaking or certain words and terminology that are very specific to us. And if you think about it, most jobs have restricted codes. Think about whatever jobs you hold, and you probably have a whole bunch of terms that you use with your coworkers. Uh, let's say you're in oil. There's going to be a whole lot of different terminology that you use in oil production um, that you know outsiders would not know what the heck you're talking about, even if you're talking in English. Uh, and you know, so families are sometimes kind of restricted codes. Develop restricted codes. Um, job environments. I would say academia does. I would say universities and colleges have a whole lot of terms you have to get used to once you come to college. Uh, and as somebody that's sort of first-gen college student myself, I try to not use too much of that jargon, um, or at least explain the jargon that's being used. But I think it's nonetheless the case that university has a lot of jargon to it, and that's part of the obstacle sometimes um, for folks who um, are first-generation college students uh, like myself. So yeah, restricted codes. Um, we could talk also about things like code switching. So code switching is really just when people switch between languages or speak between different types of a language in conversation. So, you know, if somebody, if you have um, two people that are bilingual between French and Spanish and they speak between, they speak French and Spanish to each other um, intermittently, right? That would be an example of code switching. Or when I was on the Navajo reservation doing my research, uh, people would usually, you know, they'd be speaking in Navajo for like two minutes straight and then you'd hear them refer to like, you know, my Jeep <laughs> or like a word like, you know, hard drive, computer hard drive. So basically they would switch out of Navajo to briefly speak in English when they had to refer to a concept that there wasn't like a Navajo word for that. And so um, sometimes that's connect a way of like showing off or establishing identities and who belongs in what group. So for example, you have a group called the Hopi Tewa um, in New Mac or in Arizona who uh, are Tewa people, which is one Native American group from New Mexico, but due to some things that happened historically, ended up settling in Hopi territory. So they are now functionally bilingual in both Hopi Tewa. Um, and people will kind of shift which they use depending on if they're around Hopi people or around Tewa people or just around each other, kind of as a way of sort of like, oh, I'm a part of this group or I'm a part of this group or sometimes like, well, you know, uh, sometimes they'll like switch into Tewa to criticize Hopi people, even though for all intents and purposes, they're Hopi people at this point. They've, you know, been there for over a century. Um, but by switching to Tewa when they're criticizing something about Hopi culture, it's kind of like, well, we're not like that, right? Hopi, Hopi people are like that. So code switching. 
um, you probably code switch. Um, and in fact, you know, code switching can sometimes get you in trouble because that also refers to how we switch between dialects. And if you were to sort of talk to your uh, boss, if you have a boss in sort of a way that's overly informal like you would with a buddy, you know, you may very find yourself with um, in deep hot water with your boss. You know, your boss might be upset with you. So we code switch kind of daily. We have to like navigate different ways of speaking depending on who we're speaking to. Um, and there's ways that you talk to your professors and there's ways you talk to, if you have a boss and there's way you talk to little kids and there's way you talk to your buddies uh, and there's way you talk to somebody you're in a romantic relationship. So we code switch often. Um, what did I want to say about states, nations? I don't even know what I'm talking about there. Um... I'm not exactly sure what I was talking about there. Okay, so those are some examples of language being connected to identity. Um, I'd also like to talk about the way in which language is connected to hierarchies of identities or um, power relationships. So you did a reading by Richard Bowman, um, Christ Respects No Man's Persons, which is a subset of a book which I love, um, an oldie but a goldie from the early 80s, which is Let Your Words Be Few, Symbolism of Speaking in Silence Among 17th Century Quakers. So if you're not familiar with uh, Quakers as a religious group, the more appropriate name, or rather the proper official name, would actually be Soci Society of Friends is the name of that religion, uh, or just Friends, to be brief. Although, you know, very early on they started being referred to as Quakers, and that's kind of stuck around. Uh, and if you've ever seen Quaker Oats, that sort of started with the idea of like a Pennsylvania Quaker person. Uh, so Quakers were a formative part of early American society in the uh, state of Pennsylvania, the colony and later state of Pennsylvania was uh, established in large part by Quaker people, including William Penn. Um, which, by the way, this seems sort of oddly apropos, given that I'm lecturing on the day after election day, which this will seem like a weird reference if you're listening to this video a year from now. Um, but Philadelphia the city of brotherly love, right, and philo for love or brotherly love. Um, arguably, one could, I think one w would probably argue, I would think that that comes from sort of the Quaker origins of the state and the heavy emphasis on Quakerism, on equality and kindness to other people uh, as a religious concept. So anyways, uh, but Quakers did not start in the United States. They started in England in, in the 17th century. And so this book is a really good study of sort of when this religion started out, how it related to other people. So it was definitely a very different form of Protestantism than all the other forms of Protestantism around it. It wasn't like Anglicanism. It wasn't like Methodism. Um, it was different, of course, than Catholicism. So it's Christianity, but it was a very different type of Christianity. And among other things, part of what made it different is, is that there was a really strong emphasis on speech as part of your religious behavior and especially certain ideas about speech which really set apart 17th century English Quakers from other English people at the time. One of the most notable of which, in which you read about, was the fact that based on certain passages from Jesus' teachings in the Bible, they considered it sinful and wrong to refer to other people as like a lord or a master over you, unless you're referring to God or Christ. And so as a result, they would refuse to use honorifics. And so honorifics is a fancy term we use for the fact that in many cultures, there's ways of marking when people are a higher status than you or a different status than you. So if you call me Professor Dunstan or Dr. Dunstan, as opposed to Adam, you're using an honorific to basically say, you have a PhD and you are a teacher. Um, and I usually don't insist on the honorific. Um, I, you know, perfectly happy just to be called Adam, but that is an honorific and a lot of professors do insist on that. And in doing so, one could argue that whether they mean to or not, it sort of sets up a hierarchy of some sort. Um, and by the way, the fact that I don't use an honorific doesn't mean that there's not a hierarchy. I still establish what your grade is, um, but it does kind of potentially set a different tone or you just think I'm lame. I don't know. Uh, but at the time in England, 17th century England, it was very common to use very elaborate honorifics, like sort of like my, you know, my Duke of, you know, Earlheim, Thomas the Third kind of things, um, or, you know, Lady uh, Cambria of the such and such estate. So these very, like, fancy ways of basically saying, like, you're the upper class landed nobility, um, or you're even royalty. And 17th century Quakers, by and large, refused to use honorifics because it was, you know, they saw it as kind of subverting the Bible and not doing what the Bible says, and we're all sort of equal before Christ. And this 
you know, and you're also supposed to don your hat, like take your hat off when somebody of high status was passing by you and they refused to do that or even touch the brim of their hat. So all of these things really made other English people, to be blunt, pissed off, um, especially people that were royalty and nobles. And so this arguably, Bowman argues, you know, fed into the persecution, really heavy persecution that a lot of early Quakers faced in England, you know, things like being chased out of town or put into the stockades or put into the prison temporarily. Um... They also kind of related to that, refused to use the formal tense. So you may not realize this, but English originally, much like Spanish or French, has a formal and an informal tense. So like in Spanish, you use tu for somebody that you're familiar with for you. But if you want to refer to somebody that you're not so familiar with or is a higher status than you, usted. Um, in English, we have the same thing. We just don't do it very often anymore because we have, if I'm talking to you and saying you, 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 or I could instead use thee and thine and thou, like they talk in Shakespeare, like they talk in some versions of the Bible. We think of that as formal language, in part because it's what's used in a lot of old school, older translations of the Bible. So we tend to think of thee and thou as that's like really formal sounding English. But actually, that's the informal tense in English. And so if you were to, you know, time travel 400 years ago, if somebody's using thee and thou, they're basically saying with the way they're referring to you, like, hey, we're buddies, or hey, we know each other well. Whereas if they were to say you, it means like, I acknowledge your higher status. And so Quakers refused to use you and would instead use thee and thou. And that persisted into the early colonial period. And, you know, you'll still hear a few folks using that sort of slightly just every once in a while. Um, I have a Quaker friend who talks about her dad using it, but like very, very rarely and just to make a point. Um, now it's pretty much not used, but at the time in early England, it was used, they used the informal tense basically to say like, we're all equal. I, I'm not going to like refer to you as above me. And so that's really fascinating, right? The way that religion is used to disrupt social hierarchies. And it also shows us how much language is used to remind people of social hierarchies in everyday conversation. So fascinating stuff and not unique to English, I might add. There's honorifics in many, many different languages. So what does this say about language? Well, among other things, uh, language is high stake stuff. People use it to set up who's above who, who's below who, who's on the same level as who. And when you mess with that, you mess with a lot, um, well, you know, which is one of the reasons why I think it's significant and important. We sometimes talk, say about words and language, oh, it's just words. Uh, but, you know, an anthropologist would say, social scientifically speaking, words have really big effects that we often don't recognize and how we refer to groups have big psychological effects, both on us and others uh, that we can really chart out. And so when we're talking, for example, about using the proper language terminology to refer to different groups of people around the world, different cultures, or when we talk about, you know, using a group's uh, name for itself rather than somebody else's name for it, I think these can have really profound effects in terms of power relationships. Um, one of the reasons, for example, why the term quote unquote Eskimo is fallen a lot out of disfavor is because it is so strongly associated with sort of pejorative speech that was used uh, towards Inuit people historically. So it's becoming a lot more popular, especially in Alaska, to instead use Inuit or Inupiat to refer to who you're referring to, or Yupik as the case may be. Um, so yeah, language, power, know your terms know what you're saying, know what you're doing. Language does stuff. It establishes identities. And that is the end of the lecture. So I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you're now as obsessed as I am with language and want to become a linguistic anthropologist. Uh, and if you do, talk to me. And if you don't, never talk to me again. Just kidding. See you next week.